that you know it's not obviously a fully stripped out track car as such is it i know you haven't got seats but you've still got sort of fairly it's it's still fairly comfortable isn't it in terms of trim and stuff so we're just kind of hoping to be able to put as much of the interior back as possible basically yeah for sure it would definitely look the nicest that way yeah i don't think leaving having to leave the center console out would really kind of suit the style of the rest of the car would it to be fair so Hopefully sure. we can get away with putting most of it back in and making it look sort of fairly... I think that's the plan for today, isn't it? Just yeah. to try and work out how to best go about doing that. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come up with something. Now, before we get carried away, let's take a look at my dope new shifter. What is that cable, Ben? That's for the reverse lockout solenoid, which they've uh, they've built in a nice little mount on here on the on the shifter for it. Because if you basically if you leave that unplugged, you get a management light on, but you know it's not actually required because it's got a manual reverse lockout on here. So nice of them to uh, to build that in. Now, lucky for us, while we were fitting the shifter to my ST, we were on the phone to 0.1, and he was saying to us that after some useful feedback from Ben at BD, that he was going to be making some exciting upgrades to all the shifters that leave the shelf in the future. Are you currently fitting in the gear linkages? Even yeah. though the light's just gone off. I'm trying to make sure they go in there properly. In the instruction manual, they do actually suggest that this whole section to the front of the shifter is actually cut out completely. Now, I can understand why, because having that there does make this um, sense console very, very difficult to get into place with this shifter. But just to make it look a bit more sort of aesthetically pleasing, if it were, I've I've cut a slot in. Um, it was still a bit of a struggle actually just to get it wrapped around there, but I think the kind of finished article just looks that little bit tidier. I know you guys can't see anything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that came out. Right, just because there's so many gauges, we've got, what, five full sets here. Rather than feeding all the wires through one by one and connecting them to the gauges there and then, I'm just opening all the gauges, all the boxes up separately. I've labelled up the harness that's in with each one, so I can then grab a whole bunch of cables. I can feed them all through, through the bulkhead, through the dashboard, everything like that, up to where the gauge pod goes. Uh, and we're going to know which one goes to the, re to the relevant gauge yeah. basically quickly before we head over to the car which of the five gauges that we've got on the table do you think is the best purchase for someone watching it depends on what you're using the car for but being as that because the st's already got oil temperature and oil pressure in the car even though okay they're not the ones that are in the car that aren't you know massively accurate um you know it sort of has already got oil and temp gauges so i would say out of this lot the afr is probably going to be yeah. the most beneficial okay. So I just need to get some wires through from the engine bay, obviously from the relevant sensors, um, up into the car and up through the dashboard to where the gauges are going to eventually call home. Cables are going through the bulkhead, the firewall if you like. Cables are going through here and we've currently got a few things fitted up top, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. Go on, just turn the ignition on, make sure we've got some action. Woo! Well, that looks cool. <laughs> what are you up to, Ben? Take your oil filter out. <laughs> you just drained the oil from the focus, and now you mentioned that you've got a slightly different sump that's going in here, or a sump plug. Yeah, so there's the original sump plug. That's going to be replaced with this adapter, which is going to accept the oil temperature sensor, which is obviously going to hook up to the gauges we've installed. Mm -hmm. That'll make that work. And then we've just got to um, fit this remote adapter into where the oil, the pressure sensor goes. Okay. That allows us to put the original pressure sensor back to keep the ECU happy 
and also to fit the pressure sensor from the aftermarket gauges. So that'll be okay. two of the gauges fully up and running. Is it a fairly simple process then, putting those in the car? Yeah, yeah, dead simple. It's cool. just nice to have access, you know, from underneath, like on a ramp. But you, know, you, you could do it at home if you wanted to. Let's go take a look. Does it look any different? Yeah, it's just got a hole in it that's got the threads for the new temperature. There's no way that it's going to focus on that, but we'll have a look. Point it up and show them. So you put the sensor in the sump underneath? Yeah. And what do you have to do next with all these wires? So we've just got all the wires obviously coming from the cabin. Uh, we've got the AFR, we've got a vac pipe for the boost gauge and the oil temp and oil pressure. So we just need to route them through the engine bay nice and tidy so we can clip them all in and connect them to the, to the sensors just so that we can link them up to the gauges. I think you're doing boost pressure now, is that correct? Down yeah. here? Yeah, I am. All right, so what's the process for that? Just, we just run a um, vac line from the cabin and we just need to add a T-piece into the, one of the existing vac lines in the engine bay, basically. Dead simple. Here's the cabling from the gauge for the oil temp. We're going to connect that into the sensor that we've put into the new uh, sump plug adapter. Um, but also we've got the cable down here for the oil pressure, which we've fitted into this remote adapter um, here. So we're going to get them connected up and we'll... Uh, Probably finish off the oil service and get the gauges tested, I think. Ben's just come and grabbed me from the office to say that he's discovered something, haven't you? Yes, yeah, so we've, we've just got the downpipe off now because just to finish up the um, the AFR gauge installation. Um, but in pulling the downpipe off, we've actually found that it's been fitted originally with with no gasket on now. Obviously, you've said you've been having some, uh, some rich fault codes. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that's just going to be the cause of that. But also the other thing is the, the downpipe locking bolts that have been fitted, they've actually been fitted without, without the little flags and the lockers, so essentially they're not doing their job. Yeah. Um, whether that's because whoever fitted them didn't know what they were or they've, I don't that's know, right. uh, unlikely that they've come off, I think, because they're, they're, they're a pretty good quality okay. fit. So. I'm glad you discovered that. Legend. Hopefully, hopefully it sorts the code for you. Now I'm sure you're all thinking, why on earth are you drilling a hole into your AirTech downpipe? Now to plug in the AFR sensor, of course, we had to make our own custom hole. Now, obviously I didn't know in part two, we'd end up purchasing a new exhaust system alongside a sports cat that already had one in it. But what a legend Ben is for giving it a go. Mm -hmm. Right Ben, so what's next? You finished the downpipe? Yeah, I've done the lamb sensor. You... Alan? Yeah, I didn't even mean to do that. Stop. Right Ben, so you've done the downpipe, what's next? Well, I've got to put the downpipe back on, um, and then we can put the oil in, and we'll uh, we'll run the car up to temps and check all the gauges, and then we'll be moving on to some brakes, I think. Right, downpipe's now on. Get some oil in the car, and we can uh, make some moves. Going to pass through the majority of it into the cabin. Um, we'll we'll coil them up, tidy and cable tie them, and then and, and tuck them away under the dashboard so that, like you say, there's no risk of anything getting caught up in any moving mm. parts or any hot, you know, the exhaust or anything in the yeah, engine bay. Sure. Sounds good to me. Millers every time. 5W40, that's what I like to hear. Millers is good though, to be fair. Good stuff. Oh, they made the caps really small. Is that amount of um, foamy stuff in there okay? Pretty normal, especially in cold weather now, condensation and stuff, yeah. Now we've got a reading. Okay. So you, ideally, you wait for that to get a reading first. It just lets the sensor um, preheat. And then you start the car up. And so then, you start, then the, car you start the car up. Yeah. done now we've got we've got um, measurements on everything we've got oil temperature to starting to show everything's all working and we've now finished up the headlight connection so 
they're quite bright and in the dark they can be quite dazzling so we've we've set them up so that if you turn the lights on for us Al you can just see the dim slightly it kind of doesn't really show that much in here because it's quite bright but at night they really do dazzle you and it'll make all the difference right so you mentioned that AFR is not that important until you're bragging you don't yeah you don't yeah your AFR readings are, are important when the engine's okay. under load yeah. and you're, you know, you're under full boost basically um, then we've got voltage there so we've you know we've got 13.8 so that shows you that you know the the alternator's charging good and um, we've got nice we've got minus 19 so we've got a good strong vacuum reading so like you see if you blip the throttle there it should come closer towards the zero right guys so welcome back to the last day oh wait you're gonna have to tune in for part two see you guys next time